All right, welcome everyone. My name is Melissa Ellefson and I'm a 12 year educator. So I spent the first eight years of my career teaching high school. Uh, prior to that, I had actually worked at the OU Health Sciences Center for about six and a half years before I started teaching. Um, and I knew all along that that was really where I needed to be. And so I made the transition kind of in my very early 30s uh, to teaching and realized that it is the best thing in the world to get to work with students every single day. Um, so thank you. I want to start out first by saying thank you for your service to students. I know that it's a life calling. Um, so thank you for everything that you do. And especially as counselors, I know you are overworked um, <laughs> and understaffed and underfunded in your buildings. Um, I currently work at Eastern Oklahoma County Technology Center. Hi, come on in. Uh, in Choctaw, Oklahoma. So this is my fourth year to be at the Tech Center. I started out in a 10th grade program uh, working with sophomores who came for one semester. And I'll talk a little more in depth about that in a moment. And I've since transitioned to doing kind of outreach. And it morphed into, over the last year, how can I help our sending school counselors and our sending schools with the ICAP process, with things that we were already doing in partnership together. So that's what I'm going to share with you today, kind of how we make it work in our world. And hopefully, there are some things that you can take and utilize to make it work in your world as well. Um, who do I have with me? So do I have middle school counselors here? Couple? All right, great. Do I have high school counselors? The bulk of us? All right. Any tech center counselors? Awesome. Cool. Uh, elementary counselors? Any lone wolves? No? Nope. All right. Any other people that otherwise not mentioned? All right, great. Okay. So my counselor friends, thank you. Um, let's get started. You ready? We'll dive right in. All right, so everyone is familiar with ICAP, yes? Can I get a show of hands real quick? How many of you have started implementing some something ICAP-ish in your districts? All right, how many of you are like, yeah, that ICAP thing, I'm not too worried about it. There have been a thousand other mandates that have come and gone throughout my life. I'm not jumping in the train until I know it's a real deal. Anybody else there? Yeah, if you don't want to admit on camera, I'm totally fine with that. Um, but I know that that's part of where we live, right? that as this process is in flux, how deep do you want to dive into the pool knowing that it may in fact change? So one of the things that I was very adamant about is that whatever changes we made needed to be for reasons other than ICAP. And if it also facilitated ICAP, great. But we weren't going to jump off and make a ton of programmatic changes that weren't going to live past a mandate that may come or go. Um, so we really thought long and hard about what our philosophical approach was going to be to every time we got to interact with students, um, not only with Career Tech, but then with our partner schools. So that's what I'm going to show you, kind of what our thought process is, what we really believe in, and ultimately rooted in all of it is fundamentally to make a difference for students, to help them think about what are their future goals, and it's never too early to start thinking about those. So, um, for those in the room who may not know, um, Career Tech has a mandate to do career development with students, starting in middle school up through high school. So Carl Perkins money is part of the federal funding that comes through, that comes to your Career Techs. And we utilize that money in different ways in different districts, but that's there and available. And our outreach activities and partnerships partly are driven by that federal mandate. The second thing that came into play was the ICAP legislation that passed in 2017. And we were already doing a couple of things at our tech center that I thought this is gonna overlay really well with ICAP. And I'm gonna talk with our counselors to see if I can't help them out in some way. I'm always looking for a way to help relieve a burden from our counselors and our teachers um, who are understaffed and underfunded. Um, so it seemed like it would be a really good fit with something we were already doing. Our partner schools, I'm sure much like your schools, I have four different schools that I work with, a 6A, a 4A, a 3A, and a 2A. And my 6A has four counselors that serve 2,000 plus students. My 4A has two counselors that serves, they've got about 140 per grade level. And then my other two have one counselor that serve a high school and high school slash middle school. So they are in many ways very, very small, trying to reach a large, large group. Uh, we meet quarterly with our counselors, middle school and high school. And so we're always looking for ways, how can we help you, what can we do? So part of the changes we made were really in, they were their requests. Hey, do you think you could? <laughs> Would you might be able to? And my answer always is, I can see what I can do about that. 
Um, and so we work really closely with them to try to make those things happen. Up next, business and industry. So as a career tech, that's certainly one of our stakeholders that we have to uh, keep in mind, right? That we're just there to serve our businesses as well as our students. And so if there's any way that we can make those two things come together, uh, then we try to do that. And last but not least, we're always in the mind of right fit, right program, right student. So what can we do starting even in middle school to make sure we get kids where they need to be for high school to be successful beyond high school? So that's kind of the thought process that went behind uh, the changes that we made in our activities for ICAP. So some of the things we do on campus and off campus. So beginning last year, we started an elementary uh, STEM club at 10 elementary sites. We have 11 total. So 10 of our 11 um, have an elementary STEM club that we sponsor, and I'll go in a little more than that. We do a sixth grade event called Future in Focus. We have a seventh grade event. We're in the, the process of piloting our seventh grade. It's called a Career Chamber Challenge. And then our eighth grade event, we do in the spring and the summer, or spring and fall, sorry. Uh, and that is in our fourth year with a really heavy dose of interaction with eighth graders. And then we have Reality Race, which is in a pilot phase, a ninth grade activity. And then all of our activities culminate in a sophomore program called Explorer that's housed on our campus. So let's talk a little bit about what we do. Our elementary STEM club started out 10 sites. We had 202 students last year, um, second grade and fourth grade. So we worked with, initially it started off, our soup meets with the soups of our sending districts. Um, and the sending districts said, hey, we need help getting elementary STEM. I didn't realize, because I worked at high school, that elementary teachers don't necessarily teach science until about the fourth or fifth grade. And so there was a real need to have early elementary, having those concepts of um, exploration, trying, failing, trying, failing, trying, failing, succeeding, right? That that's built in from a very early age for students, not only to think outside the box, but to know that through failure is where you're gonna have success, right? And that you keep trying um, to work collaboratively in groups, so on and so forth. Um, we started out with 22 teachers, so it was two teachers at each site. We did weekly meetings at each of the elementary schools. So the teachers had complete control over, and it was a local decision, which students were gonna be a part of this pilot group. So every uh, site had 20 students allotted. Um, I had one site that had two extra kids that just couldn't say no. So we ended up with 202. We weren't gonna turn two second graders down, right? They were the only two to not get in. Um, but they made that decision, and the clubs meet from anywhere from an hour and a half to two hours right after school at each site. Uh, we had monthly themed kits with activities, and so I completely kitted out. Uh, we did a boot camp with the teachers the summer before starting up, and they came up with kind of general theme ideas. And then I took that information, and I literally created kits with all the supplies that a teacher would need right down to the handouts for the students. So I was able to take a kit and literally pass it off to my teacher, because I didn't want them to have to worry about creating something new and from scratch. So we did that for them, if they would implement it um, at their local site. And then we would bring teachers back once a month to our campus to meet. How's the activity going? Is it age appropriate? Did you have enough supplies? Did they hate it? Did they love it? Um, so that we could continue to kind of refine for future years what would happen. We did a big kickoff event, and this was kind of the very first tiptoe into an ICAP process in elementary school, right? So talking with students, we had all 202 kiddos come to our campus for about two hours. We took them on a tour of the whole campus. We did straw rockets inside our seminar center, and we talked about um, very generally what kinds of things do you want to do when you grow up, right? very introductory to career fields. And in going around and looking at our different program areas, we could start having conversations about these are the kinds of things you can be when you grow up, and here's the kind of education that you need to make that happen. Um, it was awesome having second graders and fourth graders on our campus. Even our superintendent helped to do the tour groups. Uh, we had them in a groups of about 10 so that we could take the little ones across the whole campus and really give them um, undivided attention as they went through. Our culminating event that we were supposed to have in April, there was a little teacher walkout, so we weren't able to do the culminating event. This year we will do a culminating event on our campus. 
Um, speaking of this year, so it was a really, it was a great success the first year out. And our teachers decided they wanted to be able to facilitate and have more students. So we switched from it being an all year program to a one semester program so we could double the number of students. So now we're at, it's actually closer to 500 kiddos because several of our groups have said we don't want to say no to anyone. And we've said we will say yes. Um, so now we're up to 11 sites. One of our districts actually is paying for the teachers for the fifth grade and we are kidding them out. Um, so we now have second grade, third grade, fourth grade, and fifth grade. I'm in a different position this year, so I made sure to hire my replacement, who is a science teacher. So she has developed curriculum for each grade level, um, and they're doing the weekly activities still. Um, and it's been great so far. So we had the first kickoff in September. We brought that first set of, it was 220 kids uh, in September, and then we had turned right around in January, and we brought the next set in, and it was closer to 250. Um, for that one and did the kickoff event again. So our plan is to do a culminating event uh, in April and we're gonna bring in the Oklahoma Science Museum. They have a mobile museum. So we're gonna bring them to campus and set up their mobile museum and do shifts where we have kiddos with their parents come um, to, to wrap up the whole year. So it's been a great way where we can reach we ones from a very young age to get them excited about exploration and then to get them excited about things that they can do when they grow up. All right, up next, future and focus. So that's our sixth grade. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, so two years ago at Con uh, Counselors Only Conference, they, we actually hosted it on our campus. And so all of our sending school counselors were able to come. And we took advantage of the time and we started revamping um, our activities that we do. And one of the things that came about was that what we did at sixth grade wasn't very useful. We had a big carnival, we had kids come over, we played games, but it wasn't intentional and purposeful, the time that we had. It was a good time, but it wasn't intentional and purposeful. Um, so we decided that we would take our mobile classroom. So we have a great big green bus. We call it the Iguana Bus, you got a picture up there. Uh, it's an old activity bus and we've turned it into a mobile classroom. So it's got benches and uh, chairs, we put in Wi-Fi. Uh, we did all the work in-house, we had a grant for it and our students on campus help to, uh, all of the graphics that you see on the inside, all of everything was installed by our electrical trades, our HVAC, it's got heat and air inside of it because our HVAC kids put it in for us. It took us about a year and a half to get the bus up to where it needed to be, but we're able to take it to our sixth graders. So last year after the walkout was over, our teachers were scrambling for things to do and said, please, 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 can you come to us? So we went in May of last year. Um, we weren't able to hit all of them just because of schedules were a little bit wacky towards the end of the year. But we brought kids on in 20 minute increments. One school gave us a little more time. We got to spend 45 minutes with students. We had them in groups of 20 and we rotated them through. We've got surface pros inside uh, and we literally walked them through Okay, career guide, we gave them a printout of their um, assessment that they did so they could take that home with their parents, talk and discuss about career fields. So we keep it at the very general level, career fields in the sixth grade. So the six fields, we talk about that with them. Um, and then we made sure that our sending school middle school counselors have access and are utilizing Okay, career guide so they can go in and take a look at the assessments and what kids are looking at and uh, what their interests are. Um, okay, Career Guide, it had a really, really great specific for that younger age group assessment that has since changed. It's now the same assessments, uh, whether you're in high school or middle school. So it's something you definitely, with the sixth graders, you have to walk them through page by page, line by line. Um, just as a word of warning, right, one of the things in the assessment is I en would enjoy um, leading an international delegation. A sixth grader doesn't know what an international delegation is. Uh, so you have to put it in terms, right? What would a sixth grader? Would you enjoy helping to host kids from another school come to your school and show them around your school, right? That would be their level of an international delegation. So that's, you've got to kind of interpret for them in order to get good results out of it. Um, students seem to, seem to really like it. In the sixth grade, we go ahead and start talking about one, two, four or more. 
So when we were printing out their assessment results from that interest survey, on the back of it, we have the one, two, four or more information and then particular types of careers that would fall in the main career uh, fields. So again, that very general level, career fields in the sixth grade. Coming up next, so <clears throat> I have a, one of my instructors on campus who, who is the Explorer instructor, is a brilliant man. And he decided that he, he would like to take on the opportunity of creating our own escape room style activity. And we, we brainstormed, we had three of us who went through, and he was like, yeah, I think I can do that. So to Justin Gary's credit, he has come up with very elaborate um, activities that all work together in a career chamber challenge. So we started with the industrial manufacturing cluster, because seventh grade we're looking at career clusters, and he worked with um, most of our T&I instructors to create the elements that go in each one of the puzzles that the students are solving. Um, and it's worked, and I really like it so far. So we piloted last year, and he did it with his explorers just to see what kind of kinks, what do we need to work out, that was a 10th grade level. This year we brought in actual seventh graders, um, and we had them pilot it as well. And they had some really good insight. Um, what you interpret as an adult is not necessarily what a seventh grader interprets. So if there's something I would definitely want to pass along to the group, it would be to pilot, 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 and pilot again before you roll something out to hundreds of students at a time. Because um, you just never know what kind of uh, insight that the students will bring to you. Um, again, we take them through OK Career Guide as well, and we do the next assessment. So there are three assessments with an OK Career Guide, and we've chosen sixth grade to do one, seventh grade the next, and eighth grade the third, so that they we're building on it each year. Um, to make Career Chamber Challenge work, we need more than just our immediate core group. So there's three of us, myself, Justin Gary, and Casey Franks, that science teacher that we hired. Uh, but for some of our activities, we've got to call on other people. So we're lucky that we have a really great working relationship on our campus, and we work with our student services people. We pull them in, um, and we'll pull in Iguana Council members. So we have a version of student council on our campus, and we give them the opportunity to help out as well. And so, so a couple of Iguana Council members helped with the pilot on Career Chamber Challenge. So the seventh graders came to our campus at EOC Tech, um, and our goal is next year we'll bring on two more schools to do Career Chamber Challenge, and then the year after that we'll bring on the other two. Because we're talking 800 or so students if we hit the whole grade level between all four of our districts. So that one will step in because it's a little more elaborate. Um, our ultimate goal with Career Chamber Challenge is that because we had them do that first assessment in the sixth grade, that we will have the information of what career field they're really interested in and to put them in an escape room that aligns with the activities align with what their personality profile has. That's our ultimate goal. It's a big dream, and that's what we're going for. Um, so ask me in a year how that went. <laughs> but that's our goal. All right. Um, so eighth grade shadow. We're in our fourth year of eighth grade shadow. Uh, we, many tech centers do a sophomore shadow. Um, we opted to ixnay the sophomore shadow and instead to concentrate on eighth grade. One of the things that we realized about four year, years ago is that if we're waiting until the sophomore year to try to really talk to students about careers, their schedules are already set. And they're not able to get tech in as a junior and senior because they just don't have time in their schedules. Right, junior year you still have four cores that you're trying to take, which leaves you two or three electives depending on what kind of schedule you're on, if you're on block or a traditional six or seven hour day. So we knew that we needed to reach kids earlier. And we decided eighth grade was it. Right, that's when they're gonna start making their plans for high school and start laying out a schedule. Ironically enough, we made that decision the next year ICAP legislation happens. Right, we knew that it was coming through, it takes about a year, then it gets signed into law and we're like, well, we're already doing this thing. Let's make eighth grade really count. So we, um, we see all eighth graders, we have them all come to our campus. So this last year is about 800 students. Um, they're on our campus all day. From 9 a.m. to 2 p.m., we feed them lunch. Um, we're definitely looking at the career pathway level, so we're getting very specific. What is it you think you might want to do when you grow up? 
and then what type of education is going to go along with that to make it happen. So in the fall, we bring in students. Um, they're there. They go on an in-depth tour of all of our program areas. They get to talk to students. They get to talk to instructors. They do a True Colors activity. Has anyone ever done True Colors here? All right, awesome. So True Colors is just another way to look at your personality. And then we align that with, so if you're really green, which would be kind of those really deep thinkers who like to solve problems, here are the kind of careers that might be a good fit for you personality-wise. We also do a My Future Story project, which comes out of Ruby Payne's work. Has anybody ever heard of Ruby Payne or done Ruby Payne? Okay, awesome. So this is straight out of, you can open up the middle of her book, and there's a My Future Story in it that's more elementary, and I tweaked it to go along with middle school. Um, so we talk about where you're going to be in two years, right? Most of them are driving. For them, that's our sophomore program on our campus. Where are you going to be junior year when you graduate? What's your educational plan? Because we're re one, two, four, or more, right? One additional year of education after high school, two or four, if you want to have that kind of job where you can have a lifestyle that you can move out of your parents' house. Um, so we hit my future story project as well. We do custom stickers, so it's pretty cheap. It's paper and stickers, and I literally, I make the stickers myself. I, print, I put them through my printer, and now that I have Casey, Casey puts them through her printer. And after every eighth grade shadow event, we debrief with the eighth graders what worked, what didn't work. So we've, we have a, probably 200 different stickers so that students have something that apply to their lives, their interests, they can see themselves. And because we make it in-house, we can really tweak it for them. But the whole goal of My Future Story is to get them to thinking about 10 years from now, right? They'll, they'll be 24, which is not very old, but 10 years from now, where do you see yourself? What things do you need to do in between that time to make that happen for yourself? So it's one more way to reiterate, what are your goals? Where do you want to be? What's your education going to be to get you there? Um, and during lunchtime, we have half the students who do OK Career Guide and half eat, and then we flip flop. So we've got students on our campus, right? Our largest group is about 125 at a time. That absolutely would not work unless we had eighth grade teacher teams that were amazing. So we do a lot of work with our eighth grade teachers from each of the sending schools. We meet with them two times a year, and sometimes we do during the summer as well. And they are the ones who help to craft. At one point, we did a multiple intelligences activity, and the teachers were like, mm -mm, scrap that. And instead, we're doing true colors now. But the teachers, we take their advice um, as to what the activity should look like and anything we should fine tune, tweak at all. At one of our larger schools, the eighth grade teacher teams are actually enrolling the students into high school. So it's really important that we have a good working relationship with them because they're helping to set students up from the beginning um, on their, their path of education and ultimately what opportunities are available to them after high school. So in the spring, we bring them all back and they do four different rotations on our campus. So three of our program areas they get to pick and we have it split up so that they have to choose from categories. So we have a trades and industry category, I have a service category, and then I've got a tech category. So students have to see a broad range, right? They don't get to go to only things that have to do with the computer, that's what they love. They have to try out other ones as well. They spend about 45 minutes in the program area, they do an activity, um, and then their fourth rotation on their schedule is a four-year academic plan. So we go through with them and we start creating a four-year plan for high school. At the very top of the paper, we write down, what do you want to be when you grow up? And they write it in. And we have the conversation about making your courses count in high school and choosing courses that will help you with your career, your educational plan or goal. Um, the student gets to take home that paper copy. We scan them all in and we share an e-copy with middle school and high school counselors. One of our schools decided they wanted to go ahead and use OK Career Guide, and so we entered in their four-year academic plan into OK Career Guide, um, which has been great for them as well. So they have one place where it's housed that they can get to. Um, again, without that eighth grade teacher team and without the counselors, the eighth grade shadow wouldn't be nearly as successful as it is. Um, students actually show up with their four-year academic plan to enrollment. M uh, my smallest school, utilizes the eighth grade shadow and she actually enrolls her ninth graders on our campus into their high school classes. They fill out all their paperwork right there. Um, so we've used it as a way where she can have them all together at one time and it relieves a day for her 
back at school. And she's got help, right? So there are all the student services people are there to help and we can kind of help go along with advisement as well. Because it's hard when you're a one person show, it's so hard to get to every student. Um, so we're there to help out as well. Um, and it's definitely all hands on deck. We, some of our schools, we have to help provide transportation to get back and forth. Um, and if I've got to pay for a sub so a teacher can come over, we try to do anything we can to make sure that we've got the teacher team there with us, especially on that second day, that second time that they're on campus because we're doing that four-year academic plan. So you do it for like seven days or six days? It's eight. eight. Eight days in the spring and eight days in the fall. The one way that I know, because you're like, how do your instructors, who are they going to do that? So we ixnade sophomore, sophomore shadow, right? And then we used to do a ninth grade tour on our campus, and we got rid of both of those to get our instructors to buy into the two days with eighth graders, or two times with eighth graders. What year do they actually apply and for your program? For tech, they can come as early as a sophomore, so we have a 10th grade explorer program, and then they come junior, senior year. And then they can come up to two years after that um, for next step scholarship or 13th year, and kind of sometimes hear it called that. Yes, ma'am. So they apply. Instructors don't see them again. We do. What do you do? Well, we We're going to do next. Yes, that's coming up next. You got it. Yes. Okay, remind me again the three rotations in the spring. Remind me what you do. Yes. So they can go there. We have 15 program areas, and I lots of kids really wanted to do 3D modeling, animation, and design. Like I had them all lumped on one end. So I went through and grouped and said, you're going to choose one from trades and industry. You're going to choose one from I called it service, and then you can choose one from tech. And I have them go ahead and rank within each one, their top three choices within those individual categories. Um, one of the things that I found is that if you tell a student rank these things, they think they're gonna get their number one choice no matter what. And how many people here do scheduling? <laughs> that doesn't happen, especially when you've got 125 students and you've got 70 slots, right? Like that's not happening. Um, so in, hel in order to help curb that expectation, I tell them to rank one through three. And then I make them this promise. I will get you at least one of your number one choices, and I will dip no lower than your third choice in any area. It takes some erasing. Like I get it in, I got to race and flip-flop, but it's worth it. It's worth it if the students feel like they have some autonomy in what's happening. It's worth it when kids take their choices seriously, right, because that's part of what we're building with them. Um, and it's worth it to establish that credibility with them. So we spend some time doing some scheduling. And this year, do that. Does your sending school counselor do that ahead of time so they get there? They're teacher teams. We do it through the teacher team so that we don't overburden the counselor. And yes, I have a Google form and they do it all electronically. They send home a paper with their parents so the, paper can, the paper can, parents can see on the paper what they're doing, but they physically enter it into a Google form, which is nice because then we can sort and color code to my heart's content uh, when we're doing that. And if you want, later on, I actually have everything on a Google Drive, and I can pull up and kind of show you if you'd like what that looks like. Okay. Um, doot, 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 doot. So do, uh, there's a slide at the end that, yes, so far we can see that eighth grade shadow really does make a difference. And I'll get to that in one second. So what do we do after eighth grade? So we made this promise to our instructional staff, if you will buy into eighth grade, I'm not going to overburden you with other people coming through your classroom. So reality race is, it's kind of a blend of amazing race slash the game of life. Um, and it takes place on our campus, but instructors are not responsible for it. Uh, we've done our 10th grade class piloted for us last year. And this year in April, we've got it scheduled. It's April 3rd or 5th. We've got a group of about 30 students coming to campus to pilot it for us. So in any one group, group of three to five students, they have an iPad and then they each are within a particular career field, right? And they're either entry level, mid-level, or high level. And they have to go around from station to station, and each station corresponds to our program area across campus, and they make decisions about their monthly budget. So I, as an entry level person, I have a budget of $1,800. My mid-level person, right, is $2,500, and then my high person has a budget of $4,000. And so they literally get to see high school diploma, one or two years of education, four years, right? The difference that it makes and the, the level of lifestyle that you're able to lead. Um, so that's, we'll see how that goes. 
we've got it all on an iPad. We worked with our uh, web development class, and we had a gentleman in the class that helped us to kind of do some coding to see how that app is going to work. Um, we had a dream of using QR codes. We haven't made that come to life yet. Um, but that's, that's the next step that we're working towards. So keep your fingers crossed for us and wish us luck that that will go off without a hitch. I have, I'm suspecting that we're going to reach a maximum capacity of how many students we can really facilitate in the acti activity as one time. And what we're going to come up against is do we have enough time in the spring to get every ninth grader on our campus to do this really in-depth and detailed activity? Because there's a debrief that happens afterwards. Um, and again, hitting the one, two, four or more with students. So that one's still in flux. And believe it or not, this game of life used to be our seventh grade activity. And it was mass chaos. It didn't work really well and they didn't have, they're not even driving, right? Ninth graders are about to drive. So they're motivated in a little bit of a different way than a seventh grader is when it comes to making decisions about, you know, if you want to live in a big house or a small house or rent with four roommates. Then last but not least, we have an Explorer program on our campus. So it's a sophomore program. It's a one semester class. It counts as an elective credit. Uh, we have about 140, 114 students who come through a year. They're an 85 minute class. We run a bus back and forth to our four sending schools. So we pick Explorers up all day long. Um, they do a four week orientation in the class. And then they do rotations through the program areas. So they spend about three weeks at a time in any given program area. They come back for two days at the end of each rotation. And we do a Socratic circle with them. And we talk about what works, what doesn't work, who would this program be a good fit for, what were the unexpected things that you learned. They're journaling. They're in OK Career Guide a lot in that class. Um, and the, the idea is at the end of Sophomore Explorer, you will have a very definite idea about what is the best program fit for you on our campus and that you will come back and enroll. Um, so how do we make it all work? I know it seems like a lot, right? You're like, how did that happen? Well, we didn't start at all, let me preface this, we did not start all of those things at one time, right? Our Explore program has been on our campus for about 15 years and it's been modified and tweaked over time. Our sixth grade and seventh grade events were things that were already happening on our campus and we've, we've tweaked what it is that we're doing. And then we're incrementally bringing in the ninth grade. Um, so we're not doing everything all at once, all you know, dumping, jumping in the deep end of the pool, trying to make it all happen at one time. But we meet with our partner, our partner schools, our teacher teams at least twice a year. So our eighth grade team, like I said, we really meet more like three times a year with them. Um, our elementary STEM club, we're meeting once a month, plus we do a summer boot camp uh, with them every year. Our seventh grade team, um, those teachers we have worked with also kind of the team leads within the seventh graders, as well as the middle school counselors were crucial for our sixth grade group. It's really my middle school counselors that I work with on that. Um, and without those partnerships, without those relationships with the people at, the, at our schools, none of this would be possible. Um, the other thing that ends up happening because we work really hard on staying in contact with each other, they reinforce the message back at the school. So they're not just getting it when they come to tech, they're also getting the same message um, there at their school. Yeah. Right. Because in many, like especially in Choctaw, which is 6, 6A school, right. it's the teacher team leads that end up doing a lot. They do enrollment, um, they're doing chat time, so there's teachers as counselors in their school. So their system has a little bit of a different philosophy. Right. Yeah, yeah. And students are with teachers every day, all day. So if I, I, they're not that our counselors aren't great partners because they are, and our counselors are our facilitators, but it's, it doesn't work if we don't involve teachers in the message because it's, it's too much for one person to carry that burden. Does that turn out to be all teachers in that school or do they identify Team leads. It's the team leads that we meet with, yeah. So our smallest school, which is a 2A school, go Luther Lions. I'm a lion, I'm a Luther Lion. Uh, they send over about three teachers each time. And they probably have five to six in their grade level. So that's a good question. Any other questions that are popping in your head? All right. Um, 
We also meet with high school principals, middle school principals, um, and our elementary for the STEM club, I meet with them one time a year. But the others, our high school principals, we meet with quarterly, and our middle school principals, we end up meeting with about two times a year. Um, because we definitely want to make sure the administrative staff knows what's going on so that they will be supportive of when I we're like, we're bringing your kids off campus one more time, but we'll pay a sub. So it helps to have those conversations. And 100% our superintendents, we keep them informed and abreast of what's going on as well. Um, our elementary STEM club absolutely happened because Soup said we need help with elementary. So. Um, and then on our own campus, we have weekly staff meetings um, that are a part of our on-campus events. So we, I try and stay in contact with not only day-to-day, -day, but at those weekly meetings to make sure that our instructors know what's going on, they understand the purpose, and that they, they know that they are a part of the ICAP process as much as counselors and teachers and administrators are. Um, if there's one thing to definitely like take to heart, ICAP is not the sole responsibility of the counselor. That is not what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be a team effort. Now, we know <laughs> when things, legislation like this gets passed, that uh, it will sit at your feet, right? But you absolutely have to have a team to help make it happen. And for those, those folks here who are the K-12 counselors, ask your tech center. See if there's a way that you can partner, if there's some activity or event that you're already doing, if there's a way that you can tweak that to make that work to try to help out with your ICAP process. Um, I know one of the things that's really probably the most daunting is thinking of the documentation of ICAP. So the more you utilize an online system, the better. So you've got OK Career Guide completely free to you. I know some of our high schools um, are using a different system, but definitely you can utilize that as a way to document that process of we're talking about career, career development, um, and it's all housed in one location. The toolkit is supposed to be released. Have you all had any of those conversations yet about the toolkit or, or seen that yet? Okay. Um, so just know that, that there's a toolkit from the State Department of Education that's also supposed to be available to help you. All right. Yes, ma'am. Uh -huh. Do you have teachers that are specifically hired in place to lead the Explorer? Yes, then, I have one. So Justin Geary is our Explorer coordinator. Okay. Yes. And so then their experience <coughs> in the programs are with, it, with like existing teachers Correct. and Correct. students. Yes. They're just yep. observing. They're doing right. activities with them, yes. So we have a whole curriculum that Explorers, when they go, they have specific projects that they're doing, mm -hmm. but they're actually embedded in the class. Um, and we have, so in our cap limit with each one of our courses, mm -hmm. we say there's three spots for explorers. Okay. So we've made it like structurally a component of their class count. Okay. So that they save space for the explorers to come through. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, but Mr. Gary definitely, he facilitates all that. Okay. Yeah. Good question. Okay, so how do we know uh, that it's great? How do we determine success? Well, we definitely, we capture, we capture a lot of data. Um, we have a built-in feedback mechanism, so after every activity that we do, I survey, whether that's an informal survey where students are there and available, what changes do we need to make um, to more formal, so I do a Google, um, a, a Google form for all of our eighth grade shadows, spring and, and summer, boat, summer, fall, spring and fall, uh, where students give us feedback. And then in our teacher team meetings, we get feedback from that as well, and we utilize that feedback to constantly kind of tweak and fine tune so that it works. Um, we also make sure on our own campus that we let our instructors know when things go well and to help motivate them to know that what they're doing matters and that it counts and that it, it helps and that it serves a purpose. So, um, and I have found that if we're not doing a good job saying here's what worked really well, um, people aren't sure why they're continuing to do the thing that they're doing. So you, you've got to let them know when things work well and students have success. Um, so things to know about our Explorer program. About 80% of all of our Explorers, or it says 60, sorry, I don't know why I said 80, 60% of all of our Explorers enroll between junior, senior, and 13th year. Um, our eighth grade shadow, so the number of our students on the four-year academic plan who've said, yes, I want to go to tech, has increased by 10%. 
uh, which was a great thing for us because we want to make sure, do, we want to know, do kids want to come to tech, right? Um, and a lot of times, I think as adults, we fail to ask students what they want to do, what students are interested in, right? So it's a way that we can do that. And we break it down, and I have some pretty elaborate charts that show by program area, if they, if they know they just want to come to tech and they're not sure which program area, if they want to come back to the Explorer program. So that's been another thing that's been great is, especially this current academic year, the number of students who wanted to be there 10th grade, 11th grade, and 12th grade year increased pretty dramatically. Um, and I think part of it is because we're in that fourth year of our four-year academic plan, and eighth graders, now there's a, now it lives at the middle school that this is what eighth graders do. They get to go on their college visit, which is to the tech center. Um, so there's much more awareness kind of culturally at each school. It's now a part of their school culture that you come to the tech center and you're going to make some decisions about what you think your career path might be. And you get to start deciding that in the eighth grade. So that's, it's taken four years to build into that, but I think we really are finally there. Did you guys, did you all have a question? So, so the Explore program where mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, and that's in addition to coming to a program that they already knew that they were interested in. So I thought that was great that students are like, get me to tech. <laughs> I want to be there as soon as I can get there. That, that that was a big jump for us, that students wanted to come, yes, explore, in addition to, I'm pretty sure these are the, this is the program I'm going to be in. It's not something, how, not every does. Correct. Not for Explorer, no, but we have limited seating. So it's, we have 30 students that we can accommodate at any one particular session. So we do four sessions, um, a first hour, a second hour, a third hour, a fourth hour. Uh, our first hour is, each hour is a different school. So basically they've got 30 slots per semester for students who can come. So each school gets to decide how they're gonna fill this. Yes, yeah. And we're on their schedule as any other course offering. So we're an elective course for them. Yes, okay, yes. No um, we haven't had a wait, well, yes, but what we did was, so I had, so my Choctaw kids, I had about extra 20 who wanted to come one year, so I made room for them in another hour, and I called the other school, and I was like, hey, can I bump all of yours to the spring? So I made some adjustments to get them all there. So it's one semester. It's one semester. Yes, so from any given school, yeah, yep. And for a school like Luther, that's their whole class, right. so. So I have a little bit of flexibility with my smaller school to like bump in some other ones. No, Choctaw is my only block school. So that's the other thing is that one of my schools is on block and the other three are on a traditional seven hour course day. So it makes it for some interesting scheduling. But we make it work, right? I do whatever I can to make it work so that we're helping our schools out. How far are your schools We are very lucky that they're close. So Choctaw is five minutes away, Hera is 12, Luther's our furthest, it's 18 minutes away. That's how long my drive is every morning to get to work, 18 minutes. Uh, and then Jones probably takes us six minutes. So we're lucky that we're close, right? If we were Gordon Cooper, who serves 26 schools and some people are driving 45 minutes to get there, an Explorer program would be a little more challenging. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Where I'm trying to take like 40 minutes to get there, but yes. I want to go closer. Yep. And I love the concept because I've been, and I know some things like this, and I know some different careers tech centers because they're all different. Mm -hmm. But knowing I worked in high school and a middle school, and getting them to look at that, and I have a kid that's an eighth grader. Yeah, yeah. So, how do you get parents to say, oh, yeah? I mean, do you get parents to buy in an eighth grader? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, before that, we've already visited, right? We visited them in sixth grade, and they've already signed off on a permission slip, where, you know, but we've come to them. And then seventh grade, they've already come over. So by eighth grade, it's, the, oh, yeah, it's that third year tech. The, we have the green bus out in the communities as well. So we're there trying to meet parents. At the middle schools, we go to their open houses on Meet Your Teacher Night. We have the tech center bus there. And we talk to them about, hey, this is what your kid's going to get to do this year. So we try to, to get them at the beginning to buy in and come see who we are and what we're about on the bus. The bus has been a really, really great promotional tool for us. And we go to, Jones does a green and white night for their elementary, kind of back to school bash. And we're there setting up a booth. 
Luther Carnival, we go to it, Hera, we're in two of their parades. So we try to have a presence um, to make it much more doable uh, for parents to be involved. And we send material homes with students afterwards from each of our activities so they can have a conversation with their parents. And that's one of the challenges we make with students too, right? Yeah, I, I challenge you, you have your My Future Story plan, you can take this home and talk to mom and dad. Um, so we do that like one-on-one -on -one eye contact with kiddos. You're taking this home, you're talking to your parent. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? Okay, cool. Is the My Future Story um, project, is that something they do in groups or is that one long? Small groups, yes. And, we, and I walk them through it. Um, and I can show you what that looks like. So there's a handout and then there's the actual, it's like a comic strip pane and stickers that they utilize to make that happen. Yeah, and I can show you what that looks like. That one's a lot, that one's really, um, it's great to get kids thinking about where I wanna be and how am I gonna get there. And for them to understand that even in the eighth grade, they have some control. Because really eighth graders, if you spend any bit of time talking to them, they, they feel they're very grown up. And in the middle school world, they are, right? They're the oldest if they're on a sixth, seventh, eighth grade campus. Um, and they want the ability to make some decisions for themselves. Uh, even in the eighth grade, their schedule, they don't have a whole lot of freedom and flexibility in what they get to pick. Um, so helping them to see that they can start making choices now is really a powerful tool with the eighth grade kiddos. So STEM club activity. So far, they, we only had one STEM club activity that really tanked. I'll just pass along, don't do tetrahedral kites with second graders, they cry. <laughs> so that's not a good one to do if you're thinking about it. Uh, that got zero stars, and if they could have given negative, they would have on that. So we, we learned that didn't work, and we replaced that with a much more age-appropriate activity. Has anyone ever seen tetrahedral kites? They're like, it's a three-dimensional kite, and you use straws, and you have to tie knots, and there's gluing, and um, it, was, it was not good for second graders. I'll just tell you that. Uh, we doubled the number of STEM club students that we're serving this year. And then I'm really impressed. My, uh, my current REACH coordinator, Casey, she is amazing. And she managed to get a curriculum that was grade level specific. That was a goal she had for herself to do it this year. And she got it done for this semester. So we have a different curriculum and activities for second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, which is pretty amazing. And they do some really fun stuff, marble roller coasters, um, they're build, they build ton, tons of things. Um, and the other great thing is that 90% of students come to their STEM club meetings. And they wear their t-shirts every week, which is pretty amazing to see. And when we've had, like out at Hera, we did the Christmas parade, there were kids who were in their STEM club t-shirts and they would say, there goes my bus. And it was the Iguana bus for EOC. Um, so it's, it's heartwarming and fulfilling to know that the thing that you're doing impacts students in a positive way and makes a difference in their lives. Um, so this is a student from Jones and this was at our STEM club kickoff and she had added extra to her name tag and it says, this is amazing, yay with hearts and I never want to leave this place. And so that is our goal with every single student. We want them to feel like they are having, doing amazing things, right? Um, and that they never want to leave the place of education. And you all have that opportunity every single day. Um, and I do want to thank you again for all the work that you do because this is the kind of impact that you have on students.